Excuse me, um, is that a Nikon ZF? It sure is a Nikon ZF. A uh, very saucy bit of kit for a beach day. Hello friends and welcome back. We are here with the Nikon ZF today. Uh, and unlike some of my other reviews where I tend to be a little bit more rambling, this will be a little bit more of a structured, organized review. So you have some chapter notes below to be able to follow along. Buckle up, because this is going to be quite a ride. Um, here we go. First impressions. Okay, this is not an intuitive camera at all. Like, it's not like a Fuji where you can kind of pick it up and figure it out pretty quickly because you're like, oh, I just dial in my ISO and I put in my shutter speed and, you know, I put my aperture on my lens. This is not laid out that way. The lenses don't have aperture rings on them. The ISO is a whole kit and caboodle, which we'll cover. And if you come from maybe another Z camera, it wouldn't feel that way, but I've never shot a Z camera. So for me, it took a lot of patience and um, some hesitation where I was like, oh, I don't know about this. What I like about this camera. I do really like, as I mentioned, the build quality, the fit and finish. It has weather sealing, which is pretty friggin' awesome because um, it's still relatively compact. And as a travel camera, a family camera, an everyday camera, you want something that you don't have to worry about with the elements. And I do feel confident that this actually has the ability to withstand, uh, you know, some rain, some inclement conditions. It's good on the eyes. I do really like it overall. I think it's at the perfect sweet spot of uh, megapixel. So 24 megapixel full frame sensor is for me chef's kiss. I don't want more. I think more becomes cumbersome. It takes up more space, storage, more everything. The autofocus is bananas. Like it is right there. I, I maybe not on par with Sony 100%, but it's right there. It's like nipping at the heels of a Sony and it has the crazy ability to have subject detection with any manual glass. I have dumb adapters for completely unchipped lenses and it still picks up the subject detection incredibly well. Isolate the, you know, the eye even, and I can just hit my shortcut punch to zoom. I can pre-designate how much I want to zoom in with this EVF, which is not the best EVF, but totally decent, not on the level of an, a Leica SL where you have really, really crisp detail and you can pretty much focus without punch to zoom. This you do need to punch to zoom for my taste. And I punch to zoom at 200%. So I forego 100%. I jump right into 200% and I am able to grab focus really quickly. I punch it again and I jump back out. That is really, really nice and a pretty awesome unparalleled feature I have not seen from another manufacturer. Another upside of that is when I wanna travel with film and digital, I can just carry one set of lenses between my two bodies. I'm not having to worry about an APS-C crop on here or anything like that. My focal lengths will be equivalent between film and this full frame sensor. That being said, I love that this has a DX crop option in it. So I've actually shortcutted a DX crop mode in here so that I just hit it. Um, I've actually mapped it to my display button. I hit display, I punch in, effectively making this 24 to 70 zoom, um, a little bit of a telephoto lens as well. And I actually use that a shocking amount of time. Now, yes, you are cropping in on the sensor. You are losing megapixels, but you probably don't need the full 24 megapixels. And if you do, you can always up res it in Lightroom, in DxO. There are so many softwares now where I wouldn't even be mildly concerned. It has excellent battery life. Like the battery actually lasts all day. And I was shooting video and photo and basically an entire day of fairly nonstop shooting. And at the end of the day, my battery died. I do have backup batteries because I just don't feel comfortable living without them. 
but I was very impressed by the battery life on this. And it's not like I have any weird setup where I'm like turning off my screen or anything like that. That's just default out of box battery life. I'm used to having killer IBIS on micro four thirds and it's been pretty unmatched across the board. I've tried the Fuji, what is it, the SX30, I can't remember, but their latest sort of more vlog style camera. I wasn't that impressed by the IBIS. I've done all the Sony cameras, definitely not impressed by the IBIS. Like, yeah, it's cool that you can take it in post and stabilize it in post with the gyro data, but that's a whole other extra strap extra step in the process that I do not want to do, nor do I have time to do. The IBIS in this is fantastic. It's eight stops and it's super effective. And for video, it's wonderful. For stills, it's fantastic. Obviously for stills, it means you can shoot down to a much slower shutter speed. It will not stop the action. So your subjects have to be stationary, but you can shoot really, really low on your shutter speeds. And then for video, it's just incredible having that stabilization on a full frame camera in video. A dumb little detail that I also appreciate a lot is being able to establish when you're shooting auto ISO, what your minimum shutter speed will be. I do like to shoot street. I like to shoot action. I like to be able to predetermine where my shutter speed will be at minimum, at maximum, etc. So this can either you can pre-designate a minimum shutter speed so let's say i'm on the street i want a minimum of 500 let's say and it will take that into account when it's uh, doing its auto iso calculations or you can put it in auto so it will recognize what lens you have over it and sort of the stable rule of thumb is you'd shoot one over your focal length so if i'm shooting a 50 millimeter lens it's gonna you know have my minimum shutter speed at 1 50th of a second. That's pretty nice because it just gives you a certain level of confidence and assurance when you're shooting in auto ISO. It does have a secondary memory card, which is really nice. Now people might complain because it is a micro SD card, but with, with, with like a, a form factor like this, I am not bothered by that because I'm basically not taking it out. It's only there for emergency redundancy backup. Something I was surprised by was the touch screen. I'm like, I sound so old when I say this, but like, I'm just not used to having a touch screen and I thought I would hate it, but I'm actually really liking it, especially for like the my menu settings. So I've set up sort of the key menu items that I repeatedly go back to and, you know, formatting of SD card, for example, is so easy. I just go to my menu, I tap it, format, format, and it's done. And I don't have to like fiddle with buttons. I don't actually use it for the autofocus, which you can do. You can sort of drag your autofocus point around with your finger on the back of the screen. That's a step farther than I would want to take it. But for all your touch menu functionality, swiping of photos, zooming in, all of that. It is really, really nice. A super, super important point for me when I was looking at this camera was the ability to have separate assignments and memory for video versus still. One of the things that absolutely drives me crazy or drove me crazy on the Sony a6600 that I had as kind of a hybrid modern camera was you know you'd set it up for stills and you'd get something great and then you want to switch it into video and you're gonna have to go back in and reset everything and figure out you know get to your 50th of a second if you're shooting 24p blah 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 with this what is wonderful is you're shooting in photo mode you're doing all your settings you're at one four thousandth of a second because you're in daylight and you want to shoot 2.8 on your lens and then you switch into video with just a quick flip of your dial and you're at 50th of a second because it's remembering what you had last and you've set it up for video that way. And um, it, it just makes it much faster and easier to function. One thing that it does do in stills is it shoots H-E-I-F mode or HIF or HEIF. I don't know how to say it. How do you pronounce HEIF? And do you say HEIF? No one says HEIF. Users can now shoot in 48 megapixel HEIF. It's the format that kind of Apple's been using on their iPhones. I don't use it, but I do think it's probably where we are going, you know, evolving out of JPEG into HIF, HIF, however you say it. Um, so it is nice because it just makes me feel like it's a little bit more future-proof. The metering is fantastic. I have mentioned this in a lot of my older digital 
you know, video reviews, like I will go into spot metering mode and then sometimes center weighted metering and then sometimes matrix based on the circumstance or the situation. I'm used to having to flip between modes. This, I just haven't had to do that. Like the matrix metering is really smart. And even where I would expect a camera to get fooled, like maybe in a dark forest or something like that, it seems to figure it out and do the metering appropriate to that circumstance. So, you know, call it AI or whatever you want. There's clearly some algorithms in here that it is figuring out kind of what it's looking at and sort of adjusting its exposure for that. It's not always gonna be right, but it is right 99% of the time. It also has pixel shift, which is not something I have used extensively in my testing so far, but is definitely something I've been excited about for some time. I am gonna be taking this to Yosemite very shortly, and I will be very excited to have the ability to expand my 24 megapixels to, I can't even remember what it is, like 78 megapixels or something like that. You do need a tripod though. It's not a handheld uh, pixel shift mode that you find on say like an Olympus. You can process your images in camera. You can adjust your exposures after the fact. You can adjust your contrast, all that kind of stuff. And then you can just wirelessly drop it to your phone. I know I sound antiquated in this respect. I have had other cameras that have wireless functionality. Um, it's just really nice to have the ability to have an all mobile workflow should you so choose. And I've actually been really focusing on that with this testing period, really just trying out JPEGs and downloading them to my phone, doing a quick edit. I've actually really enjoyed Snapseed, um, which is a free editing software on my phone. And I basically just drop in the JPEG, apply a really basic standard look to it, and then post that on Instagram. And that's my post for the day. And it's fun, it's light. Maybe it lends itself a little bit too much to fluid posting, like over posting, just because it doesn't give as much rigor to what you're posting. But if it's like your personal feed on Instagram, who cares? Just post whatever you want, right? So it is really fun and it is nice to have the ability to do that. The high ISO is, it's just nuts. Like I, it's funny because I look back at my feed on Instagram with all of my vintage digital cameras. You basically don't see any night photography because they're just, you know, they're very limited in their ISO with those CCD sensors and whatnot. It's just older tech. With this, I'm like shooting 40,000 ISO, no problem. Yes, you see noise. Yes, you see grain. I don't mind that. I kind of really like actually the character of the noise in this camera. It has a, a real sort of coarse graininess to it that feels a bit more analog and like they've leaned into the grain versus trying to eliminate it. I do turn off all my noise reduction in this camera. Um, you do that through the menus. I don't want it to do any processing. And this little black and white switch is something that I thought was kind of gimmicky. Like I was like, I don't need that. Like I don't really shoot that much black and white, but I will say I have been loving shooting black and white because it's just so easy. So I just flip that switch and I find myself doing it way more than I would have expected. And it is really nice. And I, I really like just a straight up monochrome setting. It's punchy, it's got quality, but still detail in the shadow. It's a lovely profile. I think Nikon's done a great job with their JPEG settings for monochrome. And having that switch there is just absolutely way more practical, way more delightful than I would have ever, ever considered before. And the rich tone profile, the color profile, is really beautiful. I think the one thing for me, for my taste, is I do want to err on the side of warmth in my white balance. Many, many options for white balance as well as white balance trim if you further want to push your white balance within the spectrum to more of a yellow, amber, green, magenta, whatever you want. You have so much control and customization. And white balance is, I think, one of the most overlooked aspects of getting a beautiful out of camera shot. So I really do love that. Lastly, the friggin glass for the Z mount is fantastic. Like this 24 to 70 F4 kit lens, it's just a kit lens, not expensive, but excellent optically. Definitely has some distortion and some vignetting, but it corrects it in camera, or you just put the profile on in Lightroom, corrects it. It is sharp. 
it is small, compact, paired with something like the 35 millimeter 1.8 S, that lens is bananas. It is so beautiful. It has such, it's so interesting because it's modern, it's sharp, but it has character. Like, I don't think that that's a lens that I look at and go, meh, that's sterile. It has a beautiful fall off and I really, really, really like that lens. Not to mention both are weather shield. So fantastic little travel combo. That's the end of the review, right? Like I have no complaints. No, I do. I do. I have a lot. What I don't like about this camera. What was Nikon thinking when they developed this camera? Because the ergos on this without the grip are just honestly god awful. I get it. Like they were trying to model it off of their film camera like the FM2 or the FM3 or whatever. And that's all good and well, right? And if there wasn't a lens on here, that would maybe be fine. But the truth of the matter is they don't have enough lenses that are small enough to fit on this body and make it in any way not front heavy. The small rig grip that you can get, they partnered with small rig on this grip. It is really nice. It, you know, it's well aligned to the body. It fits beautifully. I do hope that Sigma will jump in with some of their lenses or 2.8s that are really, or not 2.8s, but yeah, 2.8s. They're the smaller form factor and they would complement this body really nicely. But even so, I just, I just would not shoot this camera without the grip. The other thing that bothers me is there's just a limited number of custom function buttons. I get it, they're trying to keep it streamlined and clean, but there's just some like logic flaws because for example, I wanna be able to map my punch to zoom in a way that lets me jump straight to 200%. And I can't do that in the menus through the sort of the button they, ascribed to be the punch to zoom button. It will force me to step through 100, then 200. That's just a step more than I wanna do. So I have remapped that to my front function button and I can punch to zoom there, which is great. It jumps me straight to 200, wonderful, right? But for a camera that has so few function buttons on it, customizable function buttons, I can't now remap the punch to zoom on the back here. Like what, why? Why can't I just remap that to be something else like focus peaking, something that would be useful. So now I have two punch to zoom buttons on my camera. <laughs> Additionally, I would absolutely love if like some of my buttons just worked differently in manual focus mode. When I'm in a autofocus mode, like continuous with a native Z mount autofocus lens, I want this button to be able to be like my 3D matrix focusing mode. Great, fantastic. It's gonna lock focus on what I point my center point on or whatever my point is and lock that focus in. Great. When I'm in a manual focus mode with a manual piece of glass, just punch to zoom, dude. Like, not hard. You can work around it. Like I said, I've mapped my front button here to be punch to zoom, but then it leaves this little button on the back completely useless because it can't be remapped to anything else. I really, really wish, I think the Z9 and the Z8 have this where it's a four-way flip because when I'm shooting stills, I think of this as a great street camera. I really enjoy shooting this on the street. And what I want on the street is a waist level style finder that I can flip out this way. And I'm kind of shocked that they didn't do that. I know they're trying to keep the price point down on this, but I would have spent a hundred dollars more just to have this waist level experience where I can shoot from the hip on the street, look down, see my rough composition and just fire away. This SD card, when you have the grip on here, like I don't have large nails by any means, but like I can get my nails in there and like pull it out a little bit. But if you're maybe a guy with bigger fingers and no fingernails, you're gonna maybe wanna do this. Swing! And like let your SD card fly out because otherwise it's like a, a kind of a tweezer action to try to get your SD card out. Now don't even get started on the micro SD. You are fully gonna have to eject your battery to access your micro SD. That's not that big of a deal though because I don't treat the micro SD like a interchangeable card. I just keep that in there at all times as mentioned um, for backup. Interesting choice that this does not have a 
CF Express card as his memory. It's just a standard format SD card, old school SD card. I'm not bothered by that at all. Like I don't need the crazy high write speeds. I don't, this has the XP7 processor in it, which is their latest processor. Um, it seems fine. I don't have any issues with buffer. I don't have any issues with burst rate. So I feel fine with the regular SD card, but some might prefer the CF Express, which I imagine will come out in maybe the Z6 Mark III. The other thing that's very sort of different about Nikon versus like Fuji, again, Fuji being, I think, much more intuitive, is you have the mode dial on here. So manual, aperture, shutter, program, and then auto. You know, I do like that I can set it up for my manual everything and have it all dialed in. Like I'm at ISO 400 and I'm at 125th of a second and I'm dialed in my aperture and you have a little like nice little window to show your aperture on here because there's no aperture ring and then i can flip it into another mode like auto and immediately be able to grab a quick shot and then go back to full manual that is really nice it just doesn't really it's not natural um fuji is way more intuitive and easier to shoot from a sort of like i, I don't know i just maybe it's just because i've shot fuji but i have a little bit of a mental block on it I'm getting used to it now though. It's just taking time. There is no joystick on the back, which I'm back and forth on. I, I kind of like, again, kind of old school. I just really like a center and recompose kind of shooting method, but the autofocus on this is so good that I do sometimes just leave it in like full wide and just let it figure it out for me. It depends on the circumstance. Um, I will say though that the subject detection is not something that you, or at least that I have been able to figure out how to put into my quick menu or map to a function here. So I do have it sort of mapped here in terms of I can switch between my subject detection modes. So like human versus animal versus plane or whatever, but I can't turn it on and off with a custom button or in my quick menu mode. So I have to go into the menu to turn it off and that drives me crazy because when you're with a manual focus lens and subject detection mode, sometimes it just isn't what you want it to detect. And I just wanna turn it off quickly so I can focus on the thing that I'm trying to focus on instead of having it punched to zoom to the spot that it thinks is the subject. There's just like these little hurdles that drive me a little bit crazy. I do feel like they can address that in firmware. Hopefully we can be able to turn things on and off quickly through a custom function button or in, again, programming it to the, uh, the quick menu. Speaking of the quick menu, I'm not sure why, but the quick menu only takes up two small rows at the bottom of the screen instead of being able to take over your whole screen with more options of things that you want quick access to. I don't know why, but they have just decided to limit that for some reason. Another thing that happens, and I can't really explain this one is like, there is a, even in manual focus, whatever you have a focus point, it constantly moves around my screen. And I, every time I want to bring my camera up to shoot, I kind of have to recenter the autofocus point because it's constantly moving around. And I don't exactly know what's causing that. If it's, you know, I've turned off my touch screen and it still moves around. So it must be hitting some of these, you know, dials or whatnot. It's just a little bit annoying. It's, it's, it's small, but it is annoying that I have to constantly recenter the autofocus point. And speaking of autofocus, I will say one of my biggest gripes was just like my frustration around how many autofocus options there were. Like there are so many and I was just like, oh, this is driving me crazy. What I discovered, which is wonderful and a huge plus is that in the menu, you can go in and limit the autofocus options that are available to you when you go to like a custom button to change your autofocus setting. Cause otherwise you're cycling through like eight autofocus options just to get to the one that you want. I know for myself that I want all points wide. I want center point and I want maybe one slightly larger autofocus box. So those are the only three that I ever need or want. So I can just limit it to those and I'm cycling through three options versus like eight or whatever it is. And then probably the most contentious aspect of this camera is the auto ISO implementation. 
And I agree that it is not ideal. Auto ISO has to be turned on or off in the menu. You cannot shortcut that anywhere, including in your quick menu. You can put it into your my menu, which is nice, but I just wish it could be literally on the dial here, like the C, which is control. Just make that be auto ISO. And then the minute that I swipe out of that, this dial should override everything else because that's why there's a tile here. The other aspect of that, which is nice, which was also on the DF. Um, so I did know this, but when you do have auto ISO, one kind of workaround to trying to limit it always being in action is you can limit the bottom and upper limit of auto ISO. So you can dial into your auto ISO in your menu that you only, only want it to go from ISO 100 to 400. And then it won't go above that until you rotate this. And the only way that this overrides auto ISO is if you go to a higher value. So if it's at a maximum of 400 in your uh, menu and you put this dial at 1600, that will expand the auto ISO to 1600. That is one kind of like janky workaround. I don't know why they overcomplicated that. Other small little gripes, the Wi-Fi connectivity, I don't know. In my experience, it drops a lot, which is frustrating because like that, you just want it to be easy and seamless. It does also have Bluetooth. I haven't been using the Bluetooth. I probably should um, to get around the Wi-Fi piece. Another thing that does not bother me, but definitely I know bothers some is there is what appears to be a little cable release um, thread in here and it's not. <laughs> it's it's just cosmetic um you can put a soft shutter release in here just to give it that either aesthetic or actual experience of a sh soft shutter release but if you want to actually release the uh shutter you will need to use their bluetooth uh function or your phone or something like that you cannot put a mechanical shutter release in here it won't work there is no guard like shield guard for the sensor. And the sensor is so close to the opening of the camera that I have found in the very brief time that I've had this that I have to blow it frequently. So you're gonna want a blower if you get this camera and keep it with you because I've gotten dust onto the sensor way, way more than I have with most other cameras. Video, video stuff. stuff. On the video front, this is quite a lovely little beast. I'm really, it was one of the major draws for me was again, being able to shoot both stills and video and really have a lot of the features that I appreciate out of my FX30. Not by any means a comparison to an FX30, but it does have 422 10-bit color in here. It has 125 minute record length. So that's really important for someone like me who wants to do these talking head videos. A lot of other cameras cap out at like 30 minutes or with the Olympus, which I loved my EM5 Mark III, it would split everything into like 10 minute clips and then you'd have to assemble it all in your timeline. And it was really frustrating, especially if you're trying to sync with external audio, just a pain in the butt. So this is 125 minutes that you can do at 4K which is outstanding. It does shoot 120, but you are getting a crop at that point. So if you shoot a lot of slow-mo and you want you know, your full frame sensor, that's not gonna happen. I don't care because I never shoot high frame rates. It also has time code. Uh, so if you wanna sync with other cameras, that's fantastic. It has this flip out screen, which is one of the few, I think, to have this on the Nikon line. Again, I'm not super proficient in Nikon Z. It does turn 180, so you can do, you know, vlog to yourself content. Another knock is it has a mini HDMI out. If you wanted to use that, it's just more fiddly, less um, stable. I don't use it, I don't care. Maybe it's aimed, aimed more towards someone like me who's not using an Atomos Ninja or any like external recorder. Um, so for me, it works great, but it does have a mini, so it's just good to know. But that's pretty much it on video. I really don't have any knocks on it. Again, like the mini HDMI and the crop in 4K 120 are not things that I care about. So I'm pretty, pretty happy overall with video. The autofocus is great, and I basically have nothing bad to say. Okay, okay. Color. color. I am someone who is a big proponent of 
older digital cameras. Now, older digital cameras job was to port people over from film to digital. So they had to build their digital camera profiles with character that resembled film, or at least tried to resemble film. They needed to sway an audience to a new medium. And that was not easy to do, especially in the early days when they were much more expensive cameras, etc. So I do believe that older digital cameras have way more character out of the box than these modern digital cameras. Modern digital cameras, on the other hand, are built as clean slates. Their intention is to have no personality to the file, for the most part, so that you, as the artiste, the visionary, can impose your vision on the file and create your own look. It's built to give you maximum flexibility and minimum input or style. So that may not be what you want, but at the same time, it is really fantastic to have the flexibility that these files afford. And I do think this sensor has a little bit of magic in it. I think the dynamic range, the color flexibility, is all really, really wonderful to work with. And I'm personally very, very happy with the files coming out of this. Now for JPEG, you are definitely more limited. I do like the rich portrait tone or whatever that new profile is called. Um, and you can then further, you know, adjust things in camera. I got really excited. I got into uh, NX Studio and started playing with color in the NX Studio editor, which is from Nikon, with the intent that I would then be able to download the picture that they caught picture control, but the picture control or the profile load that onto my camera and start shooting JPEGs that looked like what I was developing on my laptop and essentially create a look for myself. I am still tweaking and trying to figure this out, but I think I'm way more limited than I thought. I have yet to figure out how to be able to translate some of my tone curves in terms of RGB or any sort of color grade into the camera itself. My understanding is it is not possible, which is super duper frustrating because it's certainly possible. It's just not something they've unlocked for us in the studio to be able to download as a preset to profile on our camera itself. So Nikon, please let us have a little bit more creative control and a little more fun by playing with some of the tones in color profiles. But that being said, like I said, with my uh, mobile workflow, I am really enjoying going into Snapseed and literally just taking some of their grainy film looks and applying it to the JPEGs. It's a one and done process. I have a couple of looks that I really like and it is a less than two minute operation where I'm importing the image, putting on the look and spitting it back out to Instagram. And it's fun, it's casual. I'm not trying to make crazy sort of statement art here, but it gives me a vibe that gives me a little bit more of that nostalgia, that mood that I get from the vintage digitals that I love so much. Versus, versus, versus. versus. I did say at the outset of this um, whole endeavor on Instagram that I would be comparing this to the DF. Now, I will admit I have not had the time to do that as extensively as I would like. I really like the Nikon DF. It is also a wonderful camera, very similar in a lot of ways. It has the dials. Again, that auto ISO high value functionality that you set on the uh, dial overriding the auto ISO set in the menu is something that generated first with the DF. I love an optical viewfinder, but the advantage that this has without question is the ability to really nail focus. As an example, I brought my DF to Atlanta when I went there for um, a meetup with a bunch of great, awesome, fun film folks and was really excited when I found these beautiful ladies on the boardwalk that we were walking on and I wanted to take their portrait. I was shooting pretty wide open. I think it was at F2.8 and I thought I was nailing focus. I even got focus confirmation in the DF window, which is like a little green dot that lights up. And I wasn't, I was not in focus and I was super disappointed to come home and realize like I'd gotten these like whatever handful of shots of these women 
and only like maybe one of them was even remotely close to being in focus because it was like back focusing. Something was off in my DF and I, I just didn't know that. Whereas with this, I would have absolutely walked away 100% confident that I had nailed the shot with the focus on the subject in the way that I would have wanted. And Fuji wise, I still do believe Fuji has a better implementation of the analog workflow in terms of dials and intuitiveness. Um, I do think I will get more and more used to the implementation of the Nikon. It is just less clear and my brain takes more time to register what to do with it. I also really like the size of Fuji cameras. Now, of course, it is a smaller sensor so they can make their body smaller, but the X-T1 is like a work of art in terms of size to performance ratio. I just love the way that camera feels in my hand and the way I can function it, the way I can dial my settings. It's also very simple. It is an older digital camera, but I do love the form factor of that camera. I don't know, man. I, 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 I am sure the X-T5 is fantastic as well, but I would still probably opt for this over that. Closing, Closing thought. thought. The theme of this channel is no bad cameras, right? I started this channel with the intent to highlight crappy old cameras that others might have overlooked thinking they were irrelevant or useless. You should never let gear get in the way of the shot or your passion. If you want to shoot, shoot anything and you will make it work. I think that is an absolute wonderful way to live and I actually really embrace and love the limitations that other cameras can give. This camera definitely lifts a lot of limitations, but just as there are no bad cameras, there are no perfect cameras. This is not a perfect camera, but I do really love it. It's not a cheap camera, but it's also quite reasonable for what it is. Don't go selling a liver to buy it, but if you have the means and you have the desire, try it out. It's a really fun camera. Is there room for improvement? A hundred percent. Am I looking forward to the Mark II eventually? For sure. Should I have bought the Z6 Mark III that I'm sure will be coming out any day now and will probably have CF Express cards and a full-size HDMI, HDMI, and potentially even 48 as a frame rate on here to be able to really do true 24p? I mean, yeah, I'm sure that's gonna be a great camera too. Again, no bad cameras. Don't get hung up on like, I have to get the perfect thing. It doesn't exist. And I'm super happy with this. So this will be my go-to for an indefinite, indefinite period of time as far as my modern camera. And I'm super happy with it. Thanks so much for being here again. It was a long one. We made it through and I will see you in the next